We're going to get canceled note, at some point. No, to self. I should not. I should Actually, not. Do, do you know if you've been canceled? Oh, probably. You, oh, you know. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> probably. In today's day and age, you are informed. On this episode of Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered, we talk about the DOJ. And more importantly, we go deep into an MLS study about what properties sell for when they're on the MLS versus not. It is an incredible show. Tune in. You talk about it privately, we talk about it publicly. This is the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered Podcast. Welcome again to the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, James Dwiggins, along with my co-host, Crazy Uncle Keith. Yes, sir. My friend, tell us about Brian Donnellan, the CEO of Bright MLS, and this juicy conversation we had. Man, it was awesome. Uh, first of all, he mentioned a book, which I'm buying today, called The Physics of Time, which has piqued my nerdy curiosity. <laughs> he mentioned that we're in the in-between, which I thought was a perfect way to describe where we are in the industry right now and some of the fights and the battles that we're having, uh, the importance of the real estate agent, the DOJ settlement. And then probably the most eye-opening for me is the on or off MLS study that Bright MLS did and the impact that that had on sales price. You will not want to miss that section of this podcast. It's going to be a great show. Tune in. It was awesome. Put in your ears, kids. Brian, welcome to the podcast. We are super excited to have you on the show. Finally, I know you and I have been crossing paths and hallways for a while, and we finally got you here. Um, uh, we have certainly very little to talk about in residential <laughs> real estate. Nothing going um, on. Slow news day every day, it seems mm -hmm. like. Sarcasm um, starts early. It yeah, does. Yeah. Well, yes. it's, it's still morning old. here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Brian, let's just start with, um, tell the the viewers and listeners, just to be begin with, just a little bit about your background, your current role, your and your career path getting here before we'll dive into some rapid fire questions and, and everything else. So we'll start with that. What you'll find is I'm pretty good at, uh, at um, making others efficient, but I am complicated. And, you know, I'm even having a conversation in my head as I'm talking about this. So my, <laughs> my, path, was not, my path was not a straight path. You know, uh, I, I went to college, as a lot of folks did, at University of Maryland, and I didn't do well. I didn't actually succeed super well that first year. So I started working. I started work for a bank and then finance. Um, and I think I, I grew up a little bit while I was doing that. And, kind of understood where I wanted to be. So I, I, went, I went back to school during the day and working at the bank as much as I possibly could. Um, and I was interested, believe it of all things, in accounting and uh, technology. And I, my, I thought my path was going to be a consultant in like accounting systems. <laughs> it just <laughs> actually, I don't know what I was thinking back then, but that's what happens when <laughs> That's what happens when you're 19 and, and 20. So I, I did all that. I went to school. I got two degrees at University of Maryland, one in um, accounting, one in, in, um, in information technology. And I decided at that point that I needed to get my CPA. So I did that. It was miserable. A uh, year and a half of mine just gone. And I actually had never had any desire to do anything in accounting, although it was a good background. So then decided I, I didn't want to do that. I worked for too many, I put in a couple of different packages and I, uh, finance packages and I didn't like that. And I did like management. I did like managing systems. Mm -hmm. So I found myself getting into management into sort of a lot of cheap off operating roles. Uh, I started out in human resources and then I went into technology and then I ended up, you know, doing a variety of different things. And, you know, it was good for me. I've been in, a, I've been in finance, I've been in investment banking, I've been in education, I've been in education technology. Um, and I came here to Bright, uh, or I, actually, I came here to MRIS before we were Bright. Right. Um, right. As a chief financial officer, and then I became the chief operating officer, like within six months. Uh, good, good, good person, friend of mine, mentor, David Sharon brought me in. Oh, I by the way, him, amazing. 2006. Shout out to David. 2006, <laughs> I told him I was going to be in this industry for three years, and then I was getting the you know what out. <laughs> can we cuss on the show or not? You can, yeah. actually. It's, a, it's actually yeah. a, a ritual that we do here, and then we <laughs> try to get canceled. Wanna, so I it is encouraged, sure it but not overdo required. Overdo it. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, and then uh, was with him. He decided he was going to retire. You know, he started putting these ideas of combining the whole Mid Atlantic and things like that. So, I worked a lot on that. Uh, we put Bright together. 
Um, it blew up famously, as most people know, when we first did it. Um, just too many moving parts at the same time. It was crazy. Uh, and then after about a year, the, the, the C, I, I took over for the CEO, CEO who was in there and um, been doing this for four or five years now, it feels like. feels like 10 or 20. But uh, And you guys are the second largest MLS in the country now, correct? I think we, I think we might be the largest, but I'm not Largest? Gonna, okay. I don't, I don't know the numbers. Counting, so. Who's yeah. counting? Who's counting? You know what? We'll just go with number one then. So yeah, let's see what I happens. I mean, we're up there. We're, we're in the top. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I want to dig deep into that and the comment you made about Bright and just some of the stuff. We'll, we'll go through some of that. Well, let's do a few uh, rapid fire questions. Sure. Keith, you can start us out on on these because we'll get we'll get all the fun stuff out about our guests. Okay. So, if you were a superhero, who would you be and why? You know, it's a it's it's an interesting question. I've I've actually never thought of it to be honest with you. And I was I was Can't talking to my, first. I was yeah. talking to my daughter last night. She's twenty eight. Um, lives in the area. Uh, anyway, and I said I said who would I be? And she's like, well, maybe Batman because you're always dealing with jokers. And I go, yeah, I was a Batman fan back in the day. That's but you know what solid. I decided on? That's pretty. Solid. I decided on on Star Lord. I decided on oh, Peter. Oh, Cole. good one. Solid. You know, you know, because I, uh, music has always been a huge, huge part of my yeah. life. And, you know, you've got songs going through your head while you're trying to save the world and all that other crap. So that's that's who I would be. And I, if I could dance, that's how I feel it would, it would, it would, <laughs> Plus, it would come out. That's coolest. not how it would come out, but that's how I imagine it would come out. And he's so dang cool. Like, he's so that's dang cool. Badass. And that that's music first is so Star Lord. We have not mm. had a Star Lord. We did. That's we didn't. A, have, we haven't had Star Lord actually or Batman for that matter. So no, that's fair. Um, Both those. Uh, Good call. You would have picked right. one of the originals on each of them. So basically, all right. Drop. Uh, favorite book or podcast uh, <laughs> this year or last year? Since this year is only three months in, so. You know, I have a lot. I've, I I do read a lot, and I I drive an hour to to work, so that's two hours a day. So one of my favorites is is the physics of time really heavy, really interesting. It's taken me a long time to read that, but but it just leaves you. So we're just wondering about a lot of things in life out there and how they work and why they work. I mean, time stretches, time gets shorter, time gets longer, time can go in reverse. And yet nobody can put their hands on time and when it started, when it didn't start. You know, Einstein's theories still work, but they don't work on the small. To me, it's fascinating. But and that's a great book and that keeps my head going. But Shoe Dog, I just finished, which was what? Phil Knight, uh, Nike great book. Guy. Yeah. Which I, I, I feel book. like is a little bit like this industry. It felt like every chapter he was running into something that was going to end <laughs> the, the future of Nike or, or uh, um, the, the, what was his first company called? The Blue Ribbon or something like that. Anyway, so that would be my f of this year. It's great. I was just actually watching that movie the other day, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's with, a great book. Too. The yeah. book, I mean, everyone always says, but the book's even better than the movie. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. All I'm right, going to get that Physics of Time book. I'm buying it today. Oh my God, I got to tell you, it, it hurts your brain. No, get I like to, to hurt my brain. Get ready for equations and, and yeah, going, my, uh, how many times, how many kind my, times can I read this and it still not make sense? <laughs> <laughs> my, dad, my dad's a mathematical physicist who studies oh. string theory. So like it's right mm. down the middle. You got, of a, head, you got a head start. You got a head yeah, start. Yeah, it's it's basically dinner conversation growing up. Yeah, so. he's like a <laughs> resident. Like he's our resident economist. He loves to study all this stuff, and and he starts talking about it. And like two minutes in, I'm literally asleep. I just call yeah, Keith before I want to go to bed, and he just says something about <laughs> string theory, and I'm out. So it, and then he calls me in the morning. Keith. <laughs> yeah, he calls me in the morning. He's like, is it good or bad? And they're like, just hot or cold. <laughs> Tell hot. me. Okay, great. I'm going to be positive it's today. Be a good day, cold. Though. Yeah. All right, yeah. last question. If you could have lunch with one person, current or historical, who would it be and why? You know, I'd like to change that question because, okay. look, you, you know. Hey, it's your pod. You know, the reality is I'd, <laughs> go, back, I'd go back to somebody historically, probably musical. You know, you know, uh, Hector Berlioz is one of my favorite. I could ask him about Symphony Fantastique. Uh, you could ask about, you know, a, a variety of different folks in, in terms of the historical context. But I'd rather bring somebody back from the future and ask them oh. what they think of where we were today. Because uh -huh. actually, when uh -huh. you're asking everybody in the past, you're gonna go, so, you know, how do you like, ask Jesus, what do you think about today? He's gonna go, you guys suck. You know what I mean? It, it's yeah. pretty much gonna be bad. <laughs> it's a technical it's interesting, term. I think to look yeah. back and ask somebody in the future what they think of where we were today. That, uh -huh. that, you right. know, everybody else from the past is gonna say, God help you guys, you're, 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 you're in a bad you know, spot. but don't you think every generation forward says the same thing about the past? Just curious. Yeah. I mean, 
my parents used to be like, your generation's so screwed. Now I'm, I'm like looking at my daughter yeah. going, your generation's so screwed. So I have um, that conversation with my mom all the time. It's really not that worse. It's just different. But I think mm. it might be getting worse. I agree with you. Yeah, but yeah. that's what all of us old folks have said every that's generation. That's why I want to bring right? somebody back from the future to see if we're right or wrong. <laughs> so, mm, fair. so you fair. think this is bad. <laughs> Let me tell you how bad it gets. <laughs> see, uh, so there's follow some hope up. in that. Quick follow-up question. Yeah. How far in the future? Like, you want 20 years, 100 years? How far in the future? I say, let's go Let's go somewhere between 2050 and 2075. Okay, yeah. Let's like, see if some of these near-term projections in terms of, you know, either, you know, <laughs> demographics or economy or, or, or burning the earth up or, or whatever. AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah AI, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a All robot right. we're bringing back. Cool. <laughs> Not, yeah, we have right. a whole weird podcast we could do on that. So I can tell um, Brian and I need to have cocktails sometime. <laughs> Brian is a great person to have cocktails with, by the way, because <laughs> yeah. conversations go all and yeah, we will. So, can't, head they can't all be the recorded. Way down. Though. Yeah, no, no perfect. Recorded. Yeah, those are the best. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's, let's jump into the meat of uh, all the stuff today. Um, so this isn't I wanted. Fun. <laughs> I mean, this is actually quite fun, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure that viewers and listeners wanted to hear us pontificate about robots in the future. Um, they probably do. Maybe. It's probably their favorite uh, part. So let's, let's dive into, you know, our industry a little bit. Um, you've been doing this a long time. You've been instrumental in, in you know, reshaping the MLS industry, um, consolidating MLSs. You've seen this industry from a, quite a few different lenses. So. Yeah. My first question is, what bothers you about real estate today? Is it is it slow to adapt, change? Um, and then, like, let's go a little deeper. Are there inhibitors that you see stopping this from occurring or progressing? And there's a lot of there's a lot of people from lots of different aspects of the industry thinking the industry needs to change. And it's whether it's lawyers, the DOJ, the FTC, MLSs, associations, brokerages. Like, what's your take on all of this? So, you know, a lot of the questions that, that we were talking about, that we were going to talk about today is sort of intertwined. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay a little bit specific on this one because, you know, I think the industry, I think the structure of it uh, all warrant, um, you know, some discussion. But, you know, the first thing I, I would say about what frustrates me about the industry today is it, it, it feels like we're in, in between, right? We're in no man's land. We're not in the past and we're not in the future. Hmm. And we're just slugging it out right now, you know, mm. and, 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 and those who are in charge are from the past. And, you know, those who want to move it forward, are obviously, are, are trying to push it in the future. And we're just in this slog fest right now. Um, and I feel I, I, I feel there's there, there, there. First of all, you know, I'm going to make the, uh, the outward statement. You know, I came into this industry, although I don't feel like I'm part of this industry. Right. This is not me. I'm sort of outside of it. Mm. So I don't I don't. I don't have the same uh, connection that maybe a broker or an agent has, right? But I understand it. You know, I've, uh, in full transparency, my, my wife is an a, is a broker and an agent, two states, and she's a buyer's agent at that. So I've been in the car, I've lived this thing, but I, mm. I've never had my paycheck at on the line. You know, and right. I think that that makes a huge difference. in when you're when you're when you're looking at this industry, but you know, I feel like we're in the in between, and and. And I feel like there's others on the outside that are, you know, it's like it's like we have a hangnail. I mean, and I'm not trying to under underestimate what it is. We have a hangnail, and they want to cut the leg off. Mm. You know what I mean? So I, I recognize there's so many wonderful things about this industry, about what brokers and agents do, and about how um, they help uh, people get in and out of homes, which is so important in in, in our life, right? Um, I'm just worried that the future is going to be different and it may not be better. And, and, and I think we all have to do all we can to help those who are trying to change this industry to make sure they're doing it for the right reasons. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I feel like it's, it's, you know, we're gonna get into a lot of different things out there. I feel, I feel like people are doing this with their feelings and not with facts. Yeah. Because I think the facts say yeah. something different than what it is they're doing. So yeah, and feelings feelings are a, normally a terrible indicator for what you should do, right? For sure. Like, yeah, like you get frustrated, you want to break something, but as soon as you break it, you're like, I kind of need my phone, right? So, like, how you feel is often a very poor barometer for the actions that you should take. 
Yeah, and I'll tell you right now, again, on, on, on uh, one of the big topics out there, buyer's agents. People feel that buyer's agents don't do anything, that they just find their house online mm. or something like that. Well, they may identify certain things. And, by, and, and my feeling has always been, you know, getting a house under contract is the easy part. Well, maybe yeah. not so much these days in some of the hot markets because you've got, you've got multiple contracts and all those things. And that's a, that, can be, that can be more challenging than me just saying, hey, we're under contract. But it's the crap that happens after that that, yeah. that, that gets you into the house that, that a, a buyer's agent is there for. You know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say listing agents don't do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying the focus right now seems to be on, on buyer's agents. Well, there's, and there's, I don't think people understand it. <clears throat> the value of buyer agency is definitely under the microscope right now. Yeah. Right. And yep. I, I think you're accurate in that the perceived value of buyer agency is lower than it should be. And the industry is either going to have to adapt or die. Right. And yep. Learn, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell yeah. you, there's listing agents out there who feel that buyers agents have no value. Yeah. So that, yeah. It, it, to me, it just kind of makes it, I, I smile at that. Well, well and, let's. Let, but there's a lot of. I mean, the ar the argument comes from so many different angles. Of there's too many real estate agents, which I think almost anybody in the industry would agree with. Um, and you know, it is an independent contractor business thus far. There are business models where, you know, agents are employees, but most, for the most part, they're all independent contractors. And because of that, they get to choose what level of service they want to do. But I always find the argument so interesting to me because a, a, a customer can interview people. Like if they want to sit down and actually ask an agent questions about what do you do? What are the services you offer? How much time does it take? What are the activities involved in the transaction? These aren't, I mean, it's the internet. You can research anything. Yeah. So. There's a there's an element of it was, it's funny, Brian, I, I've been, you know, obviously reading up on all this stuff, you know, more than most. And it seems to me that the that I feel like a lot of this, at least the, the lawsuits are, in my opinion, a straight money grab by the lawyers at the end. Uh, and there's nothing in there that's actually like, oh, yeah, a bunch of sellers called up the lawyers and said we got screwed on a transaction. <laughs> nah, didn't happen. Um, and but the government side of it, and you can see it even into the policies of the current administration, they're just literally looking for any way to reduce the cost of housing, except they're not doing the damn job of looking at how to reduce the cost of housing, which is produce more housing. Like it's it's such basic supply and demand economics to me. And so you look at this, these the, be, the policies. Not, of look, the, yeah, I'm going to jump in on that point, though. I'm not defending anyone because I'm. Um, a political, I, I sort of think they're all criminals, but there's very little that the federal government can do to control zoning at the local level. And sure. we have this heavy, heavy influence of not in my backyard, NIMBYism, right? And the federal government has very little control over zoning and building requirements and costs for permits and et cetera. That's all, that's all at the local level. Agreed. Or, uh, not all. Majority is at the local level. They can't control the supply. But they can uh, control they can... what the DOJ, the FTC, what they do. Oh, I'm not with saying Fannie they're not coming yeah. at. <laughs> yeah, but they, but yeah, yeah but uh, look, I'm not defending anyone. I like I said, yeah. I think they're all criminals. But they can't control the supply side of this. All they can control is the uh, the the costs that are associated with it within their purview. But, but even even in that. You know, and looking at real estate agents, uh, listing agents, brokers agents, this industry as it is right now, you know, uh, cooperation, you know, just saying that the commissions are too high, maybe, yeah. I don't know. But here's the thing. Let's look at the commissions. I mean, because the last I checked, you know, uh, brokers and agents were probably taking home less of that commission than they were 5, sure. 10, 15 years ago. So before you say commissions are too high, let's see where that money is going, because I have a feeling what you're going to do is make it an, an industry that actually can't support itself because you can't make any money in this industry because of all the costs involved of, of doing business. Uh, it's 100 percent accurate. This is the part, even when the Federal Reserve of Richmond just came out with their report or whatever, which was completely insane. 
They don't even understand. No, it, it is. They don't, they have no, nobody has actually sat down to actually study. Technically, I have with a, with a venture I'm doing, but no one's actually sat down and studied what a realtor does. The average realtor spends, Brian, between 80 to 100 hours working with a buyer. Yep. The average buyer thinks it's 15 to 20 hours. There's the disconnect. And by yep. the way, when they go, oh, we should do it hourly, I'm like, uh, if you want to make the consumer pay more, yeah. go for it. Have a lawyer yeah. do it. Watch when they charge you for the paperclip or every 10 minute increment on what it is. It's the other thing the lawyers want, by the way. I just I picked up on this the other day. I don't know why. Part of this is to change the business, in my opinion, so that there's more opportunity for the lawyers to pick up some of this stuff. Different conversation. But yeah. it's it's there, there's to your point, I'm going to bring it back. You said that the decisions are being made emotionally without data. I wholeheartedly agree with you that if we sat down and started to do some of the data analysis and looked at the data, we'd go, oh, it isn't actually what I thought it was. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't crappy agents that spend 20 hours working on a deal and don't do anything. Correct. But the vast majority are the opposite. That. Mm -hmm. It's everything involved. It's the, you know, what is the term, what's the saying, Keith? It's what you don't see. Like it's, it's you don't know what you don't know. Most of that is yeah. because half the stuff the agent's doing is behind the scenes, but we're not yeah. showing the consumer that, which ends up being this issue. Well, um, Stephen Covey, I'm tell you, Steve. being, being, in, being in the car with my wife, I know that they know because, you know, every deal has so many different things, even today, looked at. And then I think the, 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 one of the other things that you were saying there is so you get rid of the buyer's agents and then you insert a lawyer probably <laughs> after the house is under contract. To me, I mean, the more you know up front, the more a consumer has up front, the more ammunition they have up front going into buying or selling a house, the better they are. And all of a sudden you're putting one hand behind their back. Yeah, I mean, lawyers, no offense. They, every time we, I love my lawyers, full disclaimer, sort of, but like they don't make deals come together easily. <laughs> if, they, if they're listening. They, they kill deals half the time because their job is to defend their client. So they go at it in a way that's like, it's all about my client. You put two lawyers in the room and nothing happens except the bill gets bigger. So like, it's just a, it's such a weird, it's such a weird analogy, but you mentioned something too. And Keith, I know you got some questions. I don't mean to, to take over on this, but no, I, there's good. one thing you made a comment on that I thought was really interesting. You said there's the old group that wants to keep things, I'm paraphrasing, the way things yeah. are, and there's this new group trying to push it into the future. Can you yeah. go a little deeper on that? Just your well, thoughts look, around I mean, that? You know, I, like specific I, gonna, names? Can you tell us? Yeah, like, who kidding. are you talking totally about kidding. specific? <laughs> <laughs> How many people watch this thing? Uh, 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 you know, Be careful. Just my, yeah. mom. just my mom. It's no big mm -hmm. deal. Look, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I've actually said this on, on stage many times. It's, it, it's tough. It's tough to write rules or policy when you're getting paychecks tomorrow based on what's happening today. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. I think brokers mm. out there have a model that's in place right now and they're going to get paid. So if you're telling them that's going to change, you know, they're going to have to do that while they're, while they're on the move here. Mm -hmm. So I think it's tough for them mm. to say, hey, this world's going to go like this or the world's going to go like that. But again, let's go back and let's say that. We haven't even decided that it's wrong yet in, in terms of why it must change, you know, or, or should it change? Um, and I'm, of course, I think there's some things that should be added. There's some things that some things that should be looked at and maybe addressed. But should it change? I'm not sure at the end of the day that we have enough information to say that it should change. But I do know that those that are in charge today probably have more heartburn changing because they're not ready to do that. Sure, mm. sure. I mean, you're being paid on tomorrow. And again, I go back there and say, let's see those folks who are getting a daily paycheck, have those on the line and say, hey, we're going to change how your job's done tomorrow. And they're going to go, shit, how yeah. am I going to make money? Mm -hmm. No, if the whole world turned into commission-based sales tomorrow, right? <laughs> the world would lose their damn mind. Yeah. The pe people would like, hey, you know how you think you're getting a check in two weeks? <laughs> yeah. Guess what? You're not. Sorry. Everybody yeah. would lose their marbles. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it is. That quickly. is. Yeah. Quickly. Immediately. And especially like so, government workers here in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but yes. Yes. But anyone like yeah. th most people aren't built for that. And yeah. it, that's why I love this industry so much. These are people who wake up every day and have no idea where their next paycheck is going to come from. But their bills still show up every single month. It's, it's and, so funny you say that, Keith, because like just imagine if the Federal Reserve was like, OK, let's go hourly. Mm, I'm pretty sure buyers and sellers aren't going to want to pay a bunch of money out of pocket if their house hasn't sold right away. Like, it, it, uh -huh. again, lack of data. 
right? Well, the other so, thing too is 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 I think most of these changes that are being comp contemplated out there are just going to make it harder on the buyer and seller. They're going to have to do more work on their own, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that's a better outcome. So let's transition to um, the DOJ's statement of interest that they threw out, um, and you know, get your thoughts on it. Obviously, they're wanting to decouple. So kind of a lead into the same conversation a little bit. Is that is that the future? Do you think that's the, is it the DOJ that's gonna push the industry into the next next phase? Well, you know, again, I, I wanna be careful here because this is obviously ongoing. You know, I, I looked at the, I've looked at the, uh, um, the DOJ statement, statement, of, statement interest. of interest several mm -hmm. times and my opinion, it seems like that whoever put it together doesn't know the industry. Uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into a lot of different things that we do and a lot of the studies that we do. And, you know, just pulling a brokerage out and looking that and comparing it 2016 to, to today or whatever the, the thing was, what's the market in 2016? You know, was it up? Was it down? I mean, just so many variables. I, I don't want to say whether it's right or wrong, but I do want to say I don't think it's going to get to the answer and I don't think it's going to tell you what it is that they're trying to do. <laughs> and it does feel like they're trying to get an answer here. Um, I want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but I don't think it was a good study. I don't think the outcome is right. And I think if a real study was done, and I think folks are doing real studies, we're doing a study and others have done studies on it as well. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find the outcome is not what they came up with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've been talking with some other, some other people in the MLS world who are doing studies to counter the data that they were insinuating inside and, of their statement. And James, my whole feeling on a lot of these things, we've done a lot of studies. We started our, we call it an on MLS, but it's really an analysis of off MLS. We'll go into that later. But I mean, you got to go in these things. I, I think we didn't go into doing the study to support this industry. You know, we went to do the studies. What's the right thing to do here? What makes the most sense? You know, if it doesn't come out good, then you're going to have to adjust. And if it does come out that supports the industry, then you got to find other ways to help people feel more comfortable around. Let's, it. let's go into that. Tell us about that. So this on MLS study you're referring to. Um, let's we when I first took over, I don't know what the year was. It was I don't know. It's 2019, 20, 2019. Um, and we were just getting into the beginning of CCP, and it was one of the first things we did while I was here is we, uh, we, we, we took on um, clear cooperation policy. My feeling was we, nobody had any data whether this was good or bad for the consumer out there. Nobody had, is this the right thing to do, or are we at the end doing something that's wrong? And I have to mm. tell you, I, I, I got a little pushback because if we did the study and the study came out really came out saying that, 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 that pocket listings were actually good for the consumer, mm. then we've got a whole other problem, discoverable, all that other different stuff yeah. of, of what we'd have to deal with. So we, I went in this knowing that let's do the best study we can. Let's have a whole bunch of different people, PhDs, we had university, uh, independent people look over our backs in terms of what it is we're doing. We did it several times. We brought another economist in, our own economist in, we changed it some, we made it so I think it's it's pretty airtight, um, and we did it because I wanted I wanted to be able to say, look, we've got data that says this is the right thing to do, this is best for the consumer when you do this. Just not, hey, let's just do this because we feel like it's a good thing, and I think right. we've got data that supports that. Just so, to back up a step, when you say yeah. this, you're specifically oh, referring to our putting on it MLS study. So putting it on the MLS, just in case the listeners haven't yeah, seen yeah. their Sorry study. Sorry about that. Yeah, That's okay. I, I'm known no, no. to leave a whole lot of stuff that, out. No problem. So <laughs> it, that you did a study that said if you put it on the MLS versus not on the MLS and Correct. really tracked the results. And Correct. they were overwhelmingly showed that there was the benefit was having as much exposure as possible and having it on the MLS. Is that correct? It's, it, it, it's market economics, you guys. It, it, it is. And it's yeah. been slowly going up in terms of the delta of of being on the MLS has gone up over the past three years. Um, you know, any it, data you can share? Yeah, on that? I, mean, I, I have to look at it, you know, from 2019 to 2023. Um, actually, this is a little bit different, but this is a, something else to look at 84% of all the all the listings were on the MLS, right? Mm -hmm. um, in 2022, 85.5%, mm -hmm. and in 2023, 90%. Um, 
um, mm. were actually done on the MLS, right? But when it's done off the MLS, uh, we can look at a lot of different things. We have a big footprint here. We're six states in DC. We have three right. major metropolitan areas. We have mountains, we have farms, we have, we have beach. So, so they vary, but across, across, the, uh, uh, across the bright footprint, it's about a 23% difference if you don't put it wow. on the MLS. Holy um, shit. Yeah, and that's in gone up price? over the years. In sales price? Yeah, like- in sales price, in sales price. High of, of high of twenty six percent and a low of eighteen percent, and the average across the footprints twenty three percent. Good. And it's on the it's on it's on the uh, it has a lower uh, days on market. Um, you know, there's just a lot of good things out there. It's good for both buyers and sellers because look, the reality is 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 um, if it's not on the MLS, some people are never going to see it and some people right. of color. It really is fair housing. There's a whole lot of other implications that, <laughs> that, we, I mean, have, that we have information on. I wouldn't say that we have data on yet because that's even harder, harder to collect. So if you don't have it on the MLS, um, there probably is some fair housing uh, issues. That, oh that we'll my, I with. mean, that's like a whole, so I've been, this is a James Wiggins speaking for himself, yeah. not anybody else <laughs> on this podcast or viewers or listeners. I am like, the hugely against dual agency, which for me is rep the same agent representing both sides of the transaction. This came from a study that was done, it's a long time ago, I don't remember the numbers, I'm not gonna quote them, but down in MLS listings, which is in the Bay Area, yeah. before CCP was in, in, involved, their numbers was, some, was, it was somewhere in the 30% range of properties were off market. And guess what happened about six to 12 months later for a lot of these properties not sold on the MLS. You started seeing lawsuits pop up everywhere mm -hmm. because another house was listed in the neighborhood and the seller's like, why is that house a million dollars more than the one that I was just, <laughs> that mine just sold for? Yeah. Guess what the culprit was? Yeah. Dual agency, right? So you're, that data is fascinating to me because, I'm sorry, I'm getting worked up, but I know the DOJ is looking at CCP, it's one of their things that they're concerned about. And so if I'm, unless I'm misinterpreting what you just said, that policy, maybe with some minor changes on the way it's implemented, but the, the concept of making sure that the consumer is acutely aware of the value of the MLS and encouraged to put it there is actually beneficial to them. Buyers and sellers. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, James, uh, it's a big number, Brian. That a is a big, big That's number. Crazy. That's and I would crazy. tell you that office exclusives are, are probably in line with those numbers as well in terms of the Delta. Because it's, sure, it, it's, 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 it's not out in the free It's not out in the free market. Totally agree yeah. with you. It's either <laughs> generally exposed or it's not right. A, a yeah. Office size, even if you got a large office of one hundred. You guys, it's it's, it's like market that. economics. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It's it's it's, mm -hmm. it's it's the right thing to do. And you know, I, when, when, when we're talking about you know, professionalism and everything else we do, it's the right thing. As, as a matter of fact, I was, uh, um, I was down in South Carolina and this guy had a full page, full page ad about why your listing should be on the MLS. And I meant to call the guy, I'm like, this guy is my hero. Um, he <laughs> said, you're being, con you're being conned by other folks. So, you know, I have hope. I have hope on this one because I think it is the right thing to do for both buyers and sellers and, and fair housing as well. Well, then that's good. Um, go ahead, Keith. Well, a clarifying question from yeah. I have not read. I guess I should because I feel like an idiot being on this podcast. I can send saying, you guys a link to it. No, I want to read. Yeah, we definitely need the link because we'll put it in the show notes. But I also haven't read the DOJ statement of, uh, of interest. I rely on I James for that. Three yeah, times. I know. I know. You say that every time I say I haven't read it. Uh, I've also read a bunch of books you haven't read. So, <laughs> but the question is. All of them, by the way. Yes. They. I. <laughs> They seem to be not focused on whether or not it is or is not on the MLS. They're focused on that the cl clear cooperation from a from a commission standpoint. Am I right Correct. or am I wrong? I again, we're guessing. I, I, yeah. I don't know, but I, I I suspect you're right. I suspect this is all about the 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 total amount of commission <laughs> in this. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think I've, I've heard that, you know, they think commissions should have gone down over time, you yeah. know, I guess because of yeah. house prices going up or whatever else. I, I, but they have I gone down over time, right? 
You know, I, I, I don't know that I can I, um, emphatically say that, but, but I'm told, I'm told I, that they have been. I can back that yeah. up. So yeah. in, in Real Trends has a great analysis that Steve Murray did for a long time because they're doing all the M&A deals. And it, it was 2001, it was up around 6%. And then it bottomed in 2020, 2019, 2020, just, just above 5% as an average across the country. And it had been progressively going down, picked back up a little bit, but it's been sitting down towards the bottom for a while. Um, Keith, I think one of the things that, and this is speculation, but you know, I read a lot, is the DOJ's, I think the issue is that because of the policies for um, offers of compensation in the MLS. They didn't like CCP mm -hmm. because it was requiring you people to put the property in the MLS in their words, thereby guaranteeing compensation on the other side. My, right. my, my crystal ball would be that if decoupling occurs or some version of it, or it's just zero, which we're all at now anyway, um, that it becomes less of an issue, but that's just my speculation. Um, but how do you, how do you know? Because it's no longer in the MLS. I mean, I'm going to go back and say you could decouple it. And if we had some information that, that says that's the right thing to do, I, my fear is it goes into the dark. And again, I'm going to say the more a home buyer or seller knows up front, the better they are. And actually yep. making that uh, in the back room at the very end. Under oh, I'm with you. Situations For sure. to, to me. But if, our industry's, but if our industry's solution to this lawsuit is to let's just not put it on the MLS so that we don't have uh, compensation there. Like then we're just going to get sued for that next, right? right. Like <laughs> <laughs> that can't be the solution. You've well, or, look, you just gave mean us. We can't find other ways of making yeah. uh, a compensation totally more prominent, Decoupled. more discussed, right. more known about, more yep. you know, more the whole thing. We can do it. We I think we can do a better job on that. Totally agree. Yeah. So you mentioned. So this is a. What's interesting about this dialogue is you're if if I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but after you found the data with, I think we both could agree that office exclusives is not a good idea, but the concept of CCP in theory is the right approach. My question follow up on that sort of is then, do you agree that there should be national governance of MLSs across the U S or some type of national governance policy? When you're saying that, are you talking about the rule making part of it? Yeah. Well, you know, James, I think that's that, I mean, that, that, that CCP up, originated from NAR. That's up, so that's why I'm that's up for discussion. So let's say let, let's 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 just outline a little bit. So you take them all away. It's mayhem, right? If nobody's yeah. making rules, then in, 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 in my in my six states in D.C., it's gone all over the place. Right. And you got mm -hmm. people crossing and that would just be horrible. I think it would be horrible across the country. So I think not having rules as uh, not having at least a guideline, not having at least I think best practices are probably probably light rules seems heavy but rules under the current way of adopting them is, is, is i think is horrible it's miserable it leads, it leads us to where uh, we are and you know the, the reason why I, th I think somebody we probably need to think about how we do this if you think about it and i did a little bit of research earlier do you know the retirement assets in the country are about 37 trillion and don't that that, that this is just for a comparative and the mm -hmm. total home ownership is about 30, 34 trillion. I mean, mm. the same sort of assets, same sort of things that people are living to, building up wealth and doing other things. And and who, who do we have looking over how these things are being sold? I mean, it's a big deal. Um, I don't think it would happen in any other industry. And I think we have to come to some conclusion that we're gonna have to find a better way of doing this, of, of yes. making rules, of make, and, and making them consistent. And I'm not saying what it is or isn't, I'm not saying it's an SEC body of some sort. I'm not saying something, but I, but it's got to be something that's discussed, and uh, and we find a better way of doing it. Are are you so you're suggesting not just the national governance of MLS? I, I think you're referring to just how I'm talking about the rules. The, but like, who actually is even handling a real estate transaction? I think is what you're getting to a little bit on like how do we how do we make sure that we have professional people handling the largest asset that most Americans own? Well, I think that's a little bit different than the rules okay. of, of, of transacting the house. The professionalism of that, I think, is absolutely an NAR. It's an NAR's uh, wheelhouse in terms of what it is that they should be focused on. You know, they, they do a great job of, 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 of lobbying, of, 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 you know, public affairs, whatever, however you want to call it. Um, and I think there should be a, 
a stronger focus on professionalism. It's one of the things, when you first asked me, it's one of the things that bothers me the most is a lack of consistent consistency in brokers and agents across the country and their knowledge and professionalism. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Like if you were the professionalism czar for a day, (laughs) what would, because I hear this all the time and I feel the same way. And as a, as a statement, it's very hard to say, no, our industry should be less professional. No one would say that. Okay, cool. So, but now you take the thought exercise in your one hour drive to work and you really start to think about it. Like, oh, I try to make think it... about everything but this. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, I've heard we'll make it college degree required. Okay, cool. But does that mean if you've been in the business for 20 years, you don't have I, one, you're out? Like, I don't what, think it, I, I, I how think do that, we... Look, the reality is, is I think other industries have figured this out. For God's sakes, the, 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 what is it when you're doing a hair, when you're cutting hair? I mean, they have more is, professional yeah. uh, hours than I think a real estate agent does. And cosmetology. You guys, I, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I don't know the answer to this, but I do know there's probably several industries that we can look to to help us do this. Um, and you know the other thing too that's difficult, and, and we've we fought these things for 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 a lot of reasons. Um, going back to professionalism, you know we rely a lot on brokers and agents sort of telling on other brokers and agents when they're not doing something right. Sure. Yeah. 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 But they would never do that if the other brokers and agents knew who were doing that. Right. And it's because the powerful control certain things, and I think that's a problem hmm. uh, with, with 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 how it is we do this in our in our professionalism here. So I think we we don't have. I mean, people do it, but we don't have ratings, you know, as a as a, as a mandatory thing in terms of uh, from their consumers, you know, cause, because what if? And I get it. What if you get somebody that was a really bad client? Right. And, and, and they they just shit all over. You can't recover from that. Mm-hmm. So it's a tough thing, but we, we need to figure something out. Yeah. yeah. No, that concept. I mean, you could even even if you just modeled the appraiser industry, which is real estate adjacent. Right. And you need one hundred and fifty hours of mentorship. Uh, now, that has led to some problems in the appraisal industry where they've sort of blocked people out like good people can't get in because it's very hard to find someone. Because there's always you're bas- something, right? Yeah, yeah. You're basically the other like professional. The other professionals don't have problems like 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 CPAs or lawyers or you know pick some other things, and 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 maybe you can model some some behaviors after those. I I don't have an answer to this one, but I do know it is the yeah. the, the the consistency amongst um, brokers and agents is, is is I don't think as tight as it should be. Well, a lot yeah, of that, I mean, I as agree. we all know, it's at the state level anyway for licensing requirements. Yep. Um, I mean, yep. I remember in California, and we'll move on here, but I remember when California uh, Association of Realtors was trying to pass tighter rules for getting a license. And ironically, it was it was uh, Governor Schwarzenegger who vetoed it. Um, they got it passed through the state legislature and, and the governor vetoed it because California wants 220 some thousand people to take tests and renew their licenses because <laughs> they make money. I'm not. I'm not making it up. That's literally the answer. That's, I mean, that's literally that's why it's that way in California. Um, I'm all for making it more challenging. But like, if you make the test harder, for example, then I think everyone who's in should have to take the new test. That's all I'm saying. Because yeah. I don't like it when you make it into an industry and then you pull the ladder up so that other people can't get in. Mm-hmm. That doesn't. But let's feel be right clear. Too. Not not everything. Everything that's with. And I'm saying a bad agent or a bad broker yeah. isn't because they're smart enough. There's a lot of other things. That no, have for sure. Yeah, some people yeah. are just bad people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, hundred percent. Um, we'll get a couple of last questions in here. I'll I'll ask one, and then Keith will will yeah. take us I've home on this. I've actually got one that's totally off topic, so Go. I'll save it for the. Oh, oh, no, I'll do sure. it for the end. Go ahead, because okay. yours is probably right. on topic. Um. So I, I would love to hear just, I guess like two, th- I'm gonna kind of combine these, Brian. Just yeah. one is like interesting tech you're seeing or you guys might be doing, and then kind of piggyback into that, where you see sort of the MLS evolving over the next three to five years. Where do, where do we, what's some new interesting tech you guys are doing and then where does it go over the next three to five years? If you're take, you're one of the largest or the largest in the country. So, you know, I think it's, it, it, it's actually, it's a really, really interesting question. And you know, I'm, I'm, I think I think of myself as an optimist, but I think I, I have a lot of pessimism before I get to the optim- optimistic side. That's a great description. That's awesome. Look, I, 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 I'm going to tell you, this, this industry spends more money on shit that returns nothing. 
you know, on product that goes zero. Um, it goes on auto pay and it doesn't help anybody. Uh, and, you know, that's funny. <laughs> I, you know, what's we're out here selling help? gym memberships. Brian, is that what you're <laughs> <saying>? <laughs> what's 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 gonna what what's gonna be beneficial to um, you know a, a buyer of a home or a seller of a home is probably a smarter agent. You know what I mean? Knowing the market, mm. knowing a lot of different things. You know, we focus so much on the top of the funnel. And let's get AI and on uh, searching these things, and let's let's get all these other different things. You know, fire and flood maps and all these. Are great, I think they're all great. But, but I don't think that those are the things that are going to impact this business. You yeah. know, it's after, it's after you find a house, you know, the whole transaction. I mean, that's where I think people should spend some time and some effort. Again, not again, I don't know if I said this, you know, 4.75 million, 4.5 million houses sell every year, right? It doesn't matter whether you have AI search or your goggles on or, or whatever. That's what happens. So, so how do we? How, my question is: Is how do you change the denominator? My feeling is: Is people don't move in and out of houses because it's such a, a, a hellish experience. You know, uh, getting your your mortgage. You know, moving, uh, getting ready, selling the house, all that stuff. We've done nothing on past the search of, of this. I mean, we're doing some cool things with AI. We're doing some things mm -hmm. where if you're going to put a listing in, bam, you're done. You know, all you got to do is go and check a few things. You, your, your, your photos are going to be easier and better than ever. You know, your tours, all the other different things. But, you know, I, I don't know that that makes anybody much better than what they are right now. You know, that that's my frustration with this. I don't think we're focusing in the right area of this transaction. Yeah, in some ways, that's an interesting point because and this is my personal opinion is real estate agents are brilliant humanists. I've said this a lot of times on this yeah. podcast, probably sick of hearing it. But when it comes to managing and shepherding someone through this incredibly stressful transaction that you just alluded to, they're freaking brilliant at it. They are yeah. so good, so present, su such a high emotional IQ. And to your point, uh, and, and maybe it's just because AI is data centric and, you know, but I don't see anyone developing tools to make the real estate professional a better humanist. I see him yeah. developing tools to your point to make it more efficient to input things into the data or uh, lead um, nurture methodology yeah. through AI, et cetera. Right. Um, yeah. And it'd be interesting to sort of, instead of most of the tools that are being built, maybe it's a better way to say it. And I'd love your thoughts is most of the tools that are being built are to uh, lever off an agent's weakness. And I don't see anyone building tools to lever into an agent's strength. And I yeah. think that's a miss. I think if uh, there's any entrepreneurs listening, um, maybe think about that for your one hour drive to wherever you go, um, <laughs> because th that's a miss. That's a miss. We should be anchoring deeper into our strengths instead of levering off our weaknesses. Mm. It's a yeah. good comment. Yeah. yeah. Figuring out how to, to do those touch points and making it's, funny you say that because like whenever you go to a really nice hotel mm -hmm. it, it's it's not that the sheets are any better or the beds <laughs> or linens are any better it's it's really nothing to do with the room i mean they can be nicer but the concept's the same a bed is a bed is a shower is a shower yeah. it's the people you interact with and yeah. how they interact with you is what the experience is so you're just like wow like just everything feels like you are the focus of their entire yeah. attention um, my favorite book this year so far is Unreasonable Hospitality, um, which is really anchoring into what you're saying, James, which is mm. it's not about going the extra mile. It's like going the extra 10 miles. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you don't have to do yeah. it all the time. But the that it, be unreasonable in your giving, be unreasonable in your. Uh, your sacrifice to the experience for your client yeah. or for, you know, I hate the word consumer, but um, great book for anyone who's listening. Okay. I have a question that's off topic, which yeah. you mentioned in the beginning. And I, uh -oh. I uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you said with bright and I think you were there then. And if not, this question won't make any sense, but you uh, were making a transition with bright. And then I think your words, I'm trying to put words in your mouth, but it blew up and then you had to sort of fall back and then do it again. Is that yeah. an accurate statement? It's, it's pretty close. Yeah. I'm curious, not about that experience. Uh, I'm curious what you learned. Cause I think for everyone listening, whether you're an agent or a broker owner, who's trying to operate your, we've all made mistakes yeah. and gotten over our skis and made, <laughs> made things we wish we could fix. What yeah. did you learn through that experience that you, 
that you now have in your toolkit that you can carry forward for the rest of your career that you you could share with the audience? You, you know, um, I, I I don't worry about the detractors as much as I used to. Yeah. You know, I, I I don't ignore them, but they don't they don't personally hurt like they used to. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When when eh. we brought Bright together, it was nine MLSs, and we decided to do it. There's a lot of lessons that I learned in that. So you know, mm -hmm. I think we only have a minute or two left. Um, <laughs> Bringing all of that data in, thinking that you were a technology company as MRIS and Trend sort of were at the time, we had no idea, man. It was, mm. and we brought we brought a guy in uh, to to look over what we were doing, and he 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 made um, he does fake facial recognition for all the casinos in the different places, okay. and you know you can't yeah. if you're outlawed somewhere, you can't go anywhere now because of the software that this guy came up with. So he knows okay. data. He came and he goes what the hell did you guys expect to happen? Because, you know, this is, this is a whole bunch of data. But it, it didn't change the fact that we had to fix it. Um, there were a lot of unhappy people. And look, a lot of things that I learned. Just be straight with people, completely mm. transparent. Tell yes. them everything. They're not going to yeah. like it. And, you know, maybe at some point you gain their trust that you're not lying to them. Yeah. And you gotta, you got you, you, you got to have a vision and an ability to get there. Um, and I, th I think we did. I mean, are we perfect? No, but I think I think we made a lot of strides uh, in, in in a couple of years to get where we needed to be. And I think we're we're moving beyond that now. But that was a three year effort. Yeah. It was yeah. not fun. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm, uh, um, I we me the whole staff, the board of directors took a lot of arrows for that. You just hmm. you you can't focus on the naysayers, especially hmm. especially when you know it's right. 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 And I think what you said, which is, you know, it's, it's literally in probably most leadership textbooks, but it's accurate, which is uh, you've got to be transparent. You've got to communicate clearly about where you are today and then yeah. reinforce the vision of where you're headed tomorrow. And you yeah. have well, to do I'm going to add one other. I want to add one again, other thing, Keith. And again, yeah, go ahead. And, and just knowing Brian, and this is the part that I think is that for me, out of everything you said, I'm totally agreement with it. But the one that I think is important is, is tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and that's, that's a part I think America has just lost all the way around. No one's willing to accept responsibility for anything. Look at politicians, doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, they're all liars, every single one of them. <laughs> and no one's willing to actually, well, they aren't. But people uh, no, in general, you people in general aren't willing to point the finger at themselves. And I think there's such, and it's such an amazing style of leadership to be like, you know what? I effed up. Yep. And this is what we did, and this is what we're going to do to fix it. And it's okay to shoot arrows at me, but I promise you, we're going to we're going to lead out of this, and I'm going to be transparent with you along the way. God, people, people are forgiving when you mm -hmm. do stuff like that. Um, the, the other thing too is that that I, I truly believed in. Again, like the studies and everything else we did, we're going for the right answer. This is the right thing. You know, it was the right thing to do in this big area, right? And mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever see it again unless something fundamentally changes to this industry. Um, but had it not gone that way, had we done one at a time and had it have hicked up, it, it would have never happened. It would have stopped. Right. Right. So at the end right. of the day, right. we right. did right. the right thing. And, mm. and, and look, mm. living with a broker and an agent, I know you don't screw with their day. You don't mess with their calendar. Yeah. And the minute right. you move a print <laughs> button, you've done that. And, and I get right. that. But at the same time, some folks have to learn new skills out there because whether they like it or not, they're going to have to deal with change as so well. So true. So yeah. true. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. That's uh, sure. I think that's helpful and will help people who heard it. Okay, last question. We always end on this. If you're an agent or a brokerage, what's the one thing you would implement today to help your business in 2024? So I told you I was complicated, right? Yes, you did. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I would up my game. I would up mm. my game in terms of all the different things that we were talking about. I would be, I would make sure that we were the most knowledgeable and the most professional, that we, we were responsive as you were just overly responsive transparent mm. in this world of things that are going on and and you know to me half the tools wouldn't be needed out there if folks figure out a way to stay in contact with their clients somehow some way <laughs> mm -hmm. you yeah. know yeah. just up the game man that's what that's yeah. what i would do and i think you can get you you can do it with service mm -hmm. I totally yeah. agree with you yeah great comment. brian uh 
Thanks for being here, man. I learned a lot today, and yeah. uh, there was some some statistics that I'm, I'm quite certain are going to get quoted all over the place because I don't yeah. think most people knew that number. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we'll really, put that really insightful. In the, and we'll definitely I'll get put that to, report I'll get the in the report to notes. you guys so you can do it. I enjoyed this a lot, you guys. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Awesome. Well, we enjoyed having you, and we'll look forward to having you back uh, again in the future, my friend. So I appreciate it. Thanks again. Thank you. Yes, we want you to subscribe to this podcast, but the good news is if you subscribe now, you'll never have to subscribe to any other podcast ever again.